in thinking about science and thinking about how we are going to move forward, we're here in Stockholm 50 years later, at a moment in 1972 when the world came together and decided that it needed to take action because science was then beginning to tell us something. Science was beginning to tell us that, uh, in fact, we, the world was not going in the manner that we would like it to go. And science has undoubtedly made our lives much better. I think that's a fair point. Science has delivered a lot significantly to our well-being as a society, as a civilization. And we figured out how to feed more people. We figured out how to improve environmental quality. And we figured out how to use the digital age for some good. And of course, when COVID hit us, brilliant minds sat down and came up with a vaccine in no time. So science really matter. But this idea upon which the science is placed, the base in society and economy and the systems that are prevailing, they do not work. This idea that we can take things out of the earth and into the economy based on science and create jobs and have great innovations, and then when we're done with it, we dis discard it as waste, as if there is no no cost to that. That linear model does not work anymore. We are seven and a half billion on this good earth, actually. It's never really worked, but we didn't notice our own garbage. We didn't notice our own emissions because we were so few. Now we are so many and soon we will be 10 billion. And that is why we in UNEP speak about the triple planetary crisis. That is why we speak about the climate crisis, the nature and biodiversity loss crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis, each of these driven by our unsustainable consumption and production. So on the one hand, science has been this amazing, amazing tool that has given us well-being and healthy societies. But on the other hand, those very scientific discoveries, the new chemicals, the new energy sources, the new materials, the new innovations, have caused harm to the health and well-being of our people and our planet. So science tells us, even when science tells us that it is causing harm, uh, that the economic and the social systems just keep running. And then, nevertheless, within which the very science works, those systems are not able to adapt and resist that harm fast enough. And that delay has caused great damage to people's well-being and, indeed, to the planet. So, in a way, science is the canary in the gold mine. That bird that tells us that there are too many noxious gases here and it's time to get out. But the time between the canary telling us that and the world taking action is just too slow. Now, without science, we would obviously not know how and why our planet is changing. Without science, we would not have solutions on how to steer towards a healthy planet. Without science, we would not know how these solutions can provide actually millions of a decent jobs to people in terms of green jobs. So the solution story is important, and that is why we are here in Stockholm. This meeting, this meeting 50 years after the Stockholm conference, a conference that was carved into the conscience of people across the world, because that was when we began to have a global conversation about environment. This meeting 50 years later, where we have got some good successes behind us, but a long to-do list to do this meeting meeting has to be about solutions. So as I said, science has given us a lot, but science has a lot more to give. The science community can learn from where it has come from and shape science and deliver more good and less of the bad. Today I'd like to run through four actions that I think can help the science community, where I think the science community, excuse me, can help deliver changes that we need to address that triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate, the crisis of biodiversity and nature loss, and the crisis of pollution and waste first. Decode science. Make it transparent. Make it come alive. Make it understandable. Make it actionable. Make it accessible. Right now, science is outpaced by misinformation and disinformation, which is usually presented in very short videos that fly across the social networks in everyday language, so anyone would seem to understand. And I read that 
comes then the, pre the preferred science. If we want to engage with a wider audience and combat misinformation, we have to show that science is accessible. And that is not about dumbing science down. Science has to be sophisticated and complicated because by its very nature it is, but we need to be able to communicate it in such a way effectively so that we put information in the hands of as many as possible instead of having ourselves enclosed in an ivory tower where no one can understand it. Because confirmation bias is real. The goal is to arm all signs with basic scientific knowledge to create a conversation that is based on fact, not prejudice or political or economic or power interests. And in addition to making science easier to understand, we have to make it much more accessible. Today, some 70% of scientific pub publications are hidden behind paywalls. So the question I ask is, yes, whether these paywalls are blocking scientific progress. Now, business of scholarship, business of scholarship told us um, that the largest academic publish, uh, publisher, Elsevier, which we all go to all the time, regularly has a profit margin between 35 to 40 percent. I wish them good luck. This is great for Elsevier, but that is larger than Google or Apple. So good for them but not so good for the science out there, right? Because I realize that obviously scientific orders, ne authors need to make a living, don't get me wrong, but there have to be a better way not to hide it behind paywalls between, uh, uh, and, and not to publish be behind paywalls. That surely isn't the way to go. The, the, there is a payoff to a much greater communicated science when the world discovered lead impact on children's health and communicated it well, finally it listened. And it was a long, hard fight. But when you talk to the way in which children who live next to highways are generally impaired in their cognitive ability because of the lead to which they are exposed, any voter, any parent, any responsible person will begin to act. I'll get back to later, however, to a long time that it took. So my first point is to decode science and make it more approachable. The second is to rethink that social contract that we have with science as individuals, as scientists. Essentially, we need to go back to basics of why we work in science. Because science should be about discovery. It's a little bit like the law and justice. If you study law, or do you study justice? Justice is this broader concept of justice. It is not a question of who can win the case. And in a sense, if we take that paradigm into science, science should be about discovery so that we can make the world better. Not discovery for the sake of ego, or reputation, or publication, although we understand that that publication is part of it, but it, unfortunately there is a perception, at least in some cases, not in everywhere, that the scientific community sometimes cares more about the funding or the name on the paper than the knowledge and the wisdom that it produces. Academia and national science academies across the world have a huge role to play here by promoting open science, by reforming publishing, by greater collaboration across disciplines and across communities. If we have better cooperative science, rather than competition, where academics compete for dollars, we would have much better outcomes and a lot less duplication. And here we are at this unique moment to reflect if we are equipping young graduates with the right training, the right knowledge, the right skills, and yes, the right motivation, looking at that triple planetary crisis, because friends, that is the only thing that we now must face and face squarely. There is that urgency to embed sustainability in everything we do, from engineering to physics, to geography, to biology, to the health sciences, and indeed in postgraduate and undergraduate and secondary schooling per curricula, because our our very future depends on it. 
So my second point then is about ensuring that we rethink the social contract with science. My third point deals with using science technology wisely. Technology and innovation are absolutely key to human uh, development. We understand that the digital revolution is obviously a very great accelerator. And if we use these tools well, we will find solutions. We can communicate and we can engage much better. And we can get solutions that are very real and very relevant to ordinary people. The data revolution, advanced analytics, AI, all of this has helped scientists do better, understand more, connect more, see the impacts and connectivities. In many parts of the world, science has really helped reduce emissions, hold to account. We know now that 99% that new cars are 99% cleaner than they were 50 years ago. Good, that was delivered by science. We know now that renewable energy resources can provide 3,000 times more, uh, the current, um, more than the current global energy demand. Great, emerging technology and scientific innovations have given us all of this and much, much more. And of course, technology is key, driver of entrepreneurship, driver of opportunities, driver of green jobs, and indeed uh, driver of development and poverty reduction. And so this next decade, these next five to ten years have to be the years where we flip into a green economy, where we understand that sustainable consumption and production is the only way forward because it is the only way that we can secure planet Earth for the future. But we also have to understand that thinking about long-term downsides of technology as the state of our natural environment testifies today, technology is a tool like any other. Pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers, neonicotinoids can increase our harvests. Yes, there are scientific discoveries and breakthroughs. Um, but at what cost? They can also be overused and they can overpollute our waterways and cause eutrophication in our lakes and dead zones in our oceans. Nicotinoids, as we know now, can cause impact bees and earthworms and, social, uh, and other insect populations and potentially have very serious implications for pollination and therefore for nature and food security. Indeed, a hammer can be just a tool, but it can also be a weapon uh, to, great, to do great harm. So how we use science science will matter, and that's sometimes we have to leave the hammer in the toolbox. Because we need to apply science with that understanding of what it would do to planet Earth, of what it would do to the uh, generation not yet born. So we have to think about, start to think about nature, not just high-tech technology, not just chemical innovations, but nature as a key element in our solutions toolbox, rather than always looking for newer and snazzier solutions that have a high-tech uh, element to them. Nature cools, nature filters, nature protects us against storms, against inundations, and much, much more than we could possibly do with technology. We don't need to reinvent the tree, even though we sometimes keep on trying. We just need to plant more. And I often say, if trees were providing cell phone signals, people would be busy planting trees. Too bad it only gives us the air we breathe, I mean, can we talk about that? So I think if we don't start backing nature, we will be in even bigger um, tr trouble than we are now. You, $10 trillion uh, in global GDP could be lost by 2015, 50, excuse me, if ecosystems continue their decline. On the other hand, restoring just 15% 15% of converted land could avoid 60% of species extinction. So really understanding, therefore, that we need to use technology wisely is my third point. And my last point deals with that we need to think about that, what we speak about often in the United Nations Environment Program, this science to policy interface. The science tells us thus, Therefore, we make these shifts by our regulatory settings, by our legal settings, by our global or national or otherwise municipal agreements. But we really need to think about the societal implications of what science highlights. 
And to make that happen, we need to think across these disciplines where science can drive effective policy shifts, regulatory changes or law-based changes. We need to understand sometimes that the road from science to law, policies, regulations is not that straight line, here's a science, so this is what we're going to do, so now we've fixed it. Because there is kind of an iterative process between, oh, this is what the science is, and we tried it over here, but it didn't really work, so now we have to go back, look deeper at the science, and then maybe it'll be work better if we do it this way. And when we do that kind of inquiry, we quickly discover that it's not just the hard sciences. We need the social sciences, because the, people said, the science said so, but people don't want the vaccination. Or the science says so, but there is a mood or a social media runaway non-fact that has caused other things. So understanding, therefore, the behavioral sciences and incorporating that into the paradigm has to be part and parcel of what we have to do. And so understanding that then will have us get to this more nimble, more inclusive science policy interface. But we also need to understand that we need to improve that science policy interface, first of all, to streamline the production, the knowledge production, so that we narrow the time lag between the science and the action. It was 1962 when uh, Rachel Carson published The Silent Spring, with absolute certainty pointing out that DDT and other toxics were harming human health. But the knowledge, the evidence, the scientific knowledge had been there since the 1940s. So 62, the US finally banned this substance in 1972, but the knowledge had been there since the 1940s. Or we could talk about lead. It was confirmed in the US to be deadly in 1924. 1924? <laughs> we finally had the last gas pump point the last gallon of gas into the last vehicle in the last country in August of 2021. It took UNEP a campaign of more than 20 years to phase lead out of petrol. What happens is that we are so slow from the science telling us something to us taking action. So science has to be more proactive, which is the focus of UNED's work. But as students and science students, I encourage you to step into that early, that, that early warning, that foresight, that scenario building, that predictive analysis that can be that whole new generation of integrated assessment models, which will be key to what comes ahead. Science should also, as I said, be more inclusive. If you parachute into Niger, Mali, Chad, Burkina Faso, and look with a trained academic eye on how pastoralist societies function, you just might be better off speaking to the pastoralists who've lived there for a thousand years and understand rains, understand how the sands move and have a sense for the climate and the place. So understanding, therefore, that science has to broaden out and understand that bigger diversity, that will allow us to meld ideas, that will allow us to deliver solutions, and certainly solutions that work with nature and not against it. So these are the four areas in which we can work. Decode science and make it transparent and accessible. Renew that social contract with science and go back to basic of why we joined science in the first place. Use technology wise wisely, because not always is technology the key to the problem, and overhaul that science policy interface, because we don't have the time. We don't have the time to wait from 1921 to 2021 till we ban a substance or we take the right action. Get these four points right, and science will become clearer, more accessible, more trusted, and more democratic. Decision makers will have a wide range of solutions upon which to act, and the whole of society will be involved in producing and acting on science. We could increase the chances of ending that triple planetary crisis of climate, of biodiversity loss, and of pollution and waste. Academia and national academies and universities and national funding bodies are the people and the institutions that fund research and shape new minds and old ones too. <laughs> and you can bring a huge influence to bear on reforming science and on delivering 
a brighter future. And now more than ever, it's time to lose it because we have only one planet Earth. Thank you.